Hello and welcome to my fireside chat series. Um, in this series, I'm going to be talking about Vedas. I'm going to be looking at various professional Vedas of the uh, professionals who are working in the family courts to see who these people are. Um, it's uh, pursuant to my obligations under standard 1.05 to take additional action appropriate to the situation when there's uh, potentially ethical violations by other psychologists. And one of the problems, uh, principal problems in the family courts is the absence of competence. Uh, that the, the professionals over here um, are not even at the level of the APA ethics code. And that is baseline. Uh, APA ethical standards is bottom. Um, above that is expertise and knowledge and, and acquiring Knowledge, but basic competence is required under standard 2.04. And uh, with the pathology in the family courts, it's a, an attachment pathology. So you need to have a competence and attachment system that comes from early childhood mental health, typically, um, because that's where you get trained in the attachment system, how it develops and how it works. Um, and if you don't have early childhood background, you typically are, don't have background in attachment pathology. Um, it's a, a shared persecutory delusion, so it's a delusional thought disorder in the family courts. So that requires competence in the diagnostic assessment of delusional thought disorders. Typically, you get that out of schizophrenia, that nobody else actually works with delusional thought disorder, a little bit on personality, a little bit of maybe um, bipolar disorder. But most of the time, uh, that knowledge for assessing delusional thought disorders is over in schizophrenia. It's a family systems pathology, and so we need competence in family systems, how families function. That's Mnuchin, Bowen, Haley, Madonis, and Satir, and others in the family systems. And uh, so those are the, the domains of competence that are required. And the professional vita is where you demonstrate your background, education, um, training, and experience in the various domains required for competence. So if we're working with eating disorders, we would expect to see a VITA that has background that shows the training and education in um, the diagnostic assessment and treating of eating disorders. So over here in the family courts, though, um, the licensing boards have allowed the professional standards of practice to descend into absolutely nothing. They're not even at the level of the API ethics code. And so... Um, that, that creates a lot of problems for the family courts because they're not getting competent input um, that they need to make the decisions regarding the child and that's presenting problems for the parent because many times these, these incompetent professionals are participating in the delusion and participating in the psychological child abuse because of their ignorance and incompetence. So, um, and then the final reason for presenting a VITA series is to assist um, attorneys in the family courts with their cross-examination of mental health testimony. So this will be educating uh, the attorneys in the family courts about how to read a professional vita. Now I'm going to try to maintain um, or not provide much um, personal commentary, much opinion uh, from my perspective regarding the uh, quality of the vitas that I'm reviewing. I will uh, allow the vitas just to simply speak for themselves. These are who these people are um, based on their background, education, training, and experience. I'm going to start with uh, Jean Mercer. She uh, has a PhD degree in experimental or general psychology. She doesn't report. It. It's not clinical psychology, um, but from, I think it's 1968 that she got her PhD in psychology. She served as a professor for a number of years at a small college back east. Then she retired in the early 2000s. And now she's um, fight, or presenting herself as an expert in attachment and an expert in family court pathology and is opining uh, considerably about the diagnostic assessment and treatment of the pathology in the family courts. So that's a, an interesting category of people who um, come to the family courts because we don't find that similar category with ADHD or autism. We don't find stray people coming in claiming to be experts in the pathology. Um, but here in the family courts, we get a lot of um, 
other people uh, who are not actually involved, who have opinions and uh, want to influence uh, judgments that are occurring in custody cases, which I believe is inappropriate. They're not involved and they don't have the background training on that. So um, let's start by looking at Jean Mercer and, and find out who she is. So this is from her blog. I got her Vita off of her blog. And so this is who she says she is. This is what she presents um, to the general public and the court. So um, starting with her education, that's where she begins. And she indicates her education is Mount, out of Mount Holyoke College from 1959 to 1961. Now, my first comment that you can see is in red is that's an awful long time ago. The 1960s, that's 60 years ago that she received her last or her education um, in, in psychology. And what updates has she had since then? Um, what sort of training or background does she have since 1968? Because there's been a lot of information coming since that point in time. Um, then she got uh, an AB degree in 63 from Occidental College and her doctorate uh, from Brandeis University in 1968. Now, I graduated high school in 1972. Dr. Mercer graduated her doctorate degree in 1968, four years prior to my graduating high school. Look at me, I'm an old guy. So that's another feature of um, Dr. Mercer's Vita is that She's been retired from her teaching for a number of years. And it's, I would suggest that she more fully embrace her retirement um, rather than trying to uh, become an active force in resolving issues in the family courts um, relative to this education. But that's, that's, that's the entirety of her education. Okay, so when you look at standard 2.01 boundaries of competence based on your education, training, and experience, Here's her education, 1968. So then um, the next place she goes to is her employment, uh, which is standard on Avita. Avita will start with your presentation of your education typically, and then it will move into your employment and then it, into um, uh, publications, if that's your domain or um, other activities, other professional activities, but um, education and employment. So let's see who, uh, where she's worked. This is her experience. Uh, so she started as an assistant professor, Wheaton College, 19, was it 67 to 69? Um, so right after she graduated, got her PhD, she got an assistant professor position at Wheaton College. Then she got an assistant professor position over at um, uh, State University in, in, or State College, University College in Buffalo from 69 to 71. So again, that's what, 40, 30, 50 years ago, she was an assistant professor right after graduating. And that's typical for people who want to be on the academic track. You get your doctorate degree in experimental or general psychology. Um, notice it's not a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. Um, she didn't list what it is. Let's go back for a second to her education. She didn't list what her doctorate degree is in. She just said PhD in psychology, but it's not clinical psychology. And that's a specific training program for clinical psychologists, the ones who diagnose, assess, diagnose, and treat pathology. Um, and then we have to get internships and postdocs based on our clinical psychology degree. She's got a degree in psychology. So it's general ed psychology or experimental psychology. Um, so she's not trained in assessment, diagnosis, or treatment of anything, uh, but based on her education 50 years ago. Um, and so then she went out and got positions at a teaching, which was consistent with uh, an experimental psychologist. Then she uh, landed her primary position at Stockton College in 74 to 77. So mid-70s, just as I'm graduating from high school, she's a uh, gets a college teaching position at Stockton College and remained there the rest of her career. Now, this is an interesting aspect of the Vita. So rather than just saying that she got a, a professor position at Stockton College or was teaching at Stockton College, that would present kind of a sparse education and, and work history. If, if she's just got that as her education and then three entries or as her work, 
that looks kind of empty. She hasn't worked very many places. She hasn't worked with ADHD. She hasn't worked with uh, anything except like teaching general education courses at a small college back on the East Coast. But she kind of expands her work um, to make it look like she's had multiple work positions when actually it's just assistant professor, then she moved up to associate professor, then professor of psychologist, and then pro uh, professor emeritus. Emeritus, is that how you pronounce it? It's basically a retired professor. That's the word. Emeritus is for retired. Um, so she's worked at Stockton College and then retired in 2006. So she retired approximately 20 years ago from any sort of active work. And so she's just kind of hanging around, I guess, hanging around the house, wondering what she's going to do now um, for the last 20 years. And she's apparently found herself an interest which is the family court custody conflict and somehow attachment pathology that she sees herself as an expert in that. So there's her entirety of her education and employment. She was educated, got a doctorate degree in experimental psychology 50 years ago, and then worked for you know 20 years, 30 years as a teaching a small, a small college on the East Coast, and then retired. Um, I'm not seeing where she's an expert in attachment pathology and family systems and delusional thought disorders or in family court pathology. That's not evident based on her uh, education and experience. So um, this is the APA ethics code relative to boundaries of competence. This is required of all psychologists. This is ethical, mandatory. We don't practice outside the boundaries of our competence. And so here we have psychologists provide services, teach, and conduct research with populations and in areas only within the boundaries of their competence based on their education, supervised experience. She hadn't had any supervised experience in any aspect of clinical psychology. She didn't have no education in any aspect of clinical psychology. Consultation, uh, I'm not aware of her seeking consultation. Study, that's probably what she'll say. She's read some books, and so she studied about clinical psychology. She studied about the family court. She studied about attachment because she's read some books. Um, or professional experience. She has no professional experience in family systems, attachment, delusional thought disorders, family court pathology. So, um, you know, the APA Ethics Code says what it says, and there's a reason for the APA Ethics Code, because practice outside the boundaries of competence will hurt people. And so there's reasons for each one of these ethical standards. And perhaps somebody should ask uh, Dr. Mercer, what is the reason for standard 2.01 of the APA ethics code? What happens if standard 2.01 is violated? Uh, mandatory standard 2.01 is violated. So for example, here's just for comparison, um, here's my beta. Um, so I have, uh, I did my supervised training at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. So I did a year of pre-doctoral supervised training at Children's Hospital. It's an APA accredited internship, which is like a really high standard of that. Um, and my rotations at Children's Hospital is supervised in training in China Bifida and early childhood education or early childhood mental health. And I went to CHLA specifically because they had a training program in early childhood mental health run through um, Dr. Marie Polson, who had a therapeutic preschool at CHLA. And getting early childhood uh, specialization is rare. And so it's you have to locate, the, there's only a few places you can go for that. And CHLA was Children's Hospital Los Angeles was one of the locations for training in early childhood mental health. And that's a specific uh, specialization, early childhood, because it involves so much brain development, zero to five. You have to know the cognitive systems, emotional systems, language systems, attachment systems, relationship systems, uh, physical sensory motor systems, language systems, everything, all the brain systems, how they each develop individually, but also how they interact to develop at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, five years. So all the way through development, you have to know all the neurobiological stuff of how the brain's developing. So it's a lot of knowledge. And so that's why it's a specialty practice. You're not allowed to practice zero to five um, unless you have early childhood mental health or you're consulting with somebody with early childhood mental health. 
because it's just a separate kind of child um, during zero to five than it is from five to 12 or um, into adulthood. So I got that background for a year of supervised training um, in from CHL, APA accredited. Then I did two years of postdoctoral supervised training, also at Children's Hospital. Um, and I sh shifted a little bit over to, I still did spina bifida, but I shifted over to another research project they had going on there, cancer, kids with cancer. So I was helping to manage a research project, multi-site research project, uh, six, uh, I think it was six, um, children's hospitals were all coming together and looking at uh, various aspects of attention deficits in kids who've been treated with uh, chemotherapy. So I was involved with that. I was still doing my, my work in, uh, on the spina bifida rotation. And then I had early childhood mental health and ADHD, where my ADHD was my community sort of focus. And then early childhood was my personal focus um, in developing that specialization. Now, licensure in California only requires one year of um, postdoc supervised, so one year pre-doc, one year postdoc, and then you're eligible to sit for the licensing exam. Um, but I, you'll notice my postdoc was two years at CHLA. And the reason is because um, the quality of training at the postdoc at Children's Hospital Los Angeles is so superior that they require two years. They say, we need two years to train you. And if you're going to come to our training program, you have to give us two years. We don't care what the licensing board says. Um, you know, yes, if you want, just want to get licensed, go get licensed, get your postdoc hours somewhere else. If you're coming to CHLA, you're coming for the training. You're coming and we need two years to train you. And that's what I did. I, I'm coming for the training. So I, I was two years of supervised training um, at CHLA. Now, I do this to note that this is what should be on a clinical psychologist. You should be noting where they receive their supervised training. And so, again, going back to the APA Ethics Code, supervised experience. So if you're working diagnostically treatment with a pathology, you have to get supervised experience. And um, then returning back to Jean Mercer, there's nothing. She never has any supervised experience in the treatment of anything. And her doctoral degree is not in clinical psychology. So she has no education in pathology. It's an assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. Not anything, not ADHD, not autism, not generally how to conduct an assessment, not how to make a diagnosis, not, how, not any treatment models. So she's not been trained, educated, or trained in any approaches to psychotherapy for anything in her entire life. She got an ed, a doctorate degree in experimental or general psychology, and she taught um, courses in general experimental psychology for 30 years and then retired. So that's um, a very uh, um, insubstantial uh, vita for demonstrating any sort of knowledge or competence in the domains that are needed for the family courts. So let's take a look. Next thing she presents is her professional activities. Okay, now, um, okay, the, the, you can present your, your um, journal articles or professional activities. But the thing that I would note for parents and for uh, attorneys, family law attorneys, is all these professional activities are fluff. They're nonsense. She got, she got a position with where she's expressing her opinion about things. Um, so for example, consulting reader, infants and young children from 92 to 2000. She has no background in infants or uh, young children. So why is she being a consulting reader to something she knows nothing about? She doesn't have any training in that based on her vita um, because she presents herself as having expertise and doing stuff, but nobody actually takes a look to see if that's backed up with her actual experience. And then she's editor of something else and, you know, editor of something else and, you know, vice president of infant mental health. She has no training in infant mental health. I'm certified out of field in graduate school in infant mental health. She has no training in infant mental health. She talking about infant mental health about president new jersey association for infant mental health 
And so that's the disconnect relative to, you know, some of these vitas. The, the people will present that they know something to the general public and to the courts. But if you actually go back and look at their vitas for education and training, they have none. They have opinions. They read books, maybe, but there's no substance or foundation to those opinions. So all I would just put all of uh, Gene Mercer's professional activities in kind of the fluffy vita kind of stuff. It, it's just expansive, but it doesn't show what training she has. She's active in telling people what her opinion is, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I necessarily see what that opinion's based on. So again, let's take a look at, at my vita relative to my background. I have infant parent infant mental health um, certification out of Field and Graduate Institute. I have I know two additional diagnostic systems for early childhood mental health: the DC zero to three uh, diagnostic criteria, which is stronger in diagnosing attachment pathology, and the DMIC diagnostic manual or diagnostic criteria um, out of Greenspan's group. Um, and that's stronger in diagnosing autism spectrum pathology. So not in addition to the DSM-5, I know two additional early childhood uh, diagnostic systems. You see anything like that on Jean Mercer's Vita? No. She has no training in early childhood mental health, and yet she's serving as president of, of these organizations about early childhood mental health. Um, I would say that seemingly meets practice beyond the boundaries of competence, but you know that's just, I'll let somebody else decide on those sorts of things. And then I additionally know two different treatment models for early childhood attachment pathology. Um, so these are standard uh, approaches in early childhood mental health. I'm trained in both of them. Um, so I received training in Watch, Wait, and Wonder out of the University of Toronto. That's for infants. Watch, Wait, and Wonder. How do you do psychotherapy? How do you do uh, attachment therapy with an infant? You can't talk to an infant. There's no, you have to work through the mother. And so that's what Watch, Wait, and Wonder is, is helping the mother understand her stuff. There's, there's basically four ports of entry. You can enter through the child's behavior or in through the child's mental representations, or you can intervene through the parent's behavior or the parent's mental representations. No matter where you intervene, it will affect all the others. So if I change how the mother sees her child, that's going to change her behavior, which is going to change how the child sees the mother, which will change the child's behavior, which will change the mother's perception of the child. So no matter where I intervene, I change the child's behavior, changes the mother's representation, changes the mother's behavior, changes the child. And so there's four ports of entry, they're called, and that's uh, Dan Stern on the motherhood constellation. But do you see any background like this over on Gene Mercer's? No. So I know two additional uh, diagnostic uh, uh, approaches, two different diagnostic systems. I know two uh, standard treatments. The other is a circle of security out of uh, Washington here. And that's for preschoolers. Uh, so I know the infant attachment therapies. I know the attachment therapies for preschoolers because I work children ages zero to five in foster care. So child protective services would remove a child and put zero to five and put them in foster care for whatever reason. Then they would send the children to our clinic for assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. So that's where my background is. Is And zero to five is spot on the attachment system and foster care is holy cow, the attachment system. So then, um, so that that's just by comparison of what and then professional experience, I was a clinical director for a three university assessment and treatment center um, for early childhood uh, mental health um, with our referral source through the foster care system. And, you know, if you get three universities involved, you know, that's a big event. And if we're getting our referral source is through uh, CPS and our funding, it was through the county department of mental health. And so that's that's all huge county involvement. There were a lot of people putting this thing together and they hired me as the clinical director. So I was in charge of all the clinical operations of the psychological treatment, as well as the occupational therapy um, coming out of Loma Linda University and the, um, the um, speech and language coming out of the University of Redlands. And so 
it, but you know they sent faculty those two universities sent faculty um over and then trainees and then cal state sent um the, hired the clinical staff but also provided faculty and trainees into the, the clinic and i was in charge of the whole thing uh, so i've had experience working diagnosing attachment pathology diagnosing severe uh, problems uh, in children jean mercer let's take a look at her publications um, because that's the only thing basically we have left her education is sparse her um her experience is sparse and her professional activities don't seem to be connected to her experience or education so let's actually like take a look at where her her research background where her substance of of her doctorate degree what what does she know and so if we look back at her research so this is she was apparently uh, went under the name of lester at this time um so it's from 1967, so again, her research is 50 years old, but it's sound localization during labyrinthine stimulation. That's sensory motor, that's perceptual. Then in 68, prism adaptation, that's sensory motor. And then rod and frame test, 1968, published in Perception Motor Skills. She's a perceptual motor experimental psychologist in the 1960s. She has no experience with attachment, no experience with any pathology ever. She has no experience assessing, diagnosing, training, um, treating anything, no education in it, no research in it. She's a, an experimental psychologist in um, uh, perceptual motor stuff. And you keep going, you know, rod and frame test, perceptual, auditory, audio gyral illusion, publishing in perception and motor. Um, so as far as I can see, and it keeps going, you know, in, you know, she has one interesting problem with less intelligent students in introductory psychologist classes. This is Lester and Lester. So apparently she published something with uh, her husband at the time, uh, her partner, who, who, because they don't like uh, uh, less intelligent students in their classes or something, I don't know. Um, and then there was another one, Lester and Lester, fear of death. Um, I hope something problematic wasn't happening. But again, these are opinion pieces. Okay, these are not research things, and they're certainly not research in attachment pathology or personality pathology, or in family court pathology or any any relevant uh, research. Um, and then you know goes back to the perception perception of polarization in some perceptual test, and then uh, vestibular stimulation. So that's that's her background. Um, now I'm totally fine if she wants to, uh, you know, have an opinion about the hotero gyral illusion or rod and frame test. Well, that's within her scope of of competence. But attachment pathology, family court pathology, narcissistic borderline, dark personality pathology, um, delusional disorders, thought disorders. I'm not seeing any background that would make her competent in, in those domains. Um, you can look for yourself, I, show it to me. But then we have 2013, after she retires, then she starts writing about attachment in children and adolescents. And Mercer, holding therapy in Britain. Mercer, uh, holding therapy. So that holding therapy was a real problematic thing. That was like, just somebody came up with this idea and, and, and yeah, I got a lot of controversy about that. It was not based in attachment at all. It was just somebody kind of coming up with that. But apparently she got an opinion about that and started going and, and you can look more and she's, she's really locked into parental alienation. It seemed, boy, she, she got locked into that and she can't adjust out of that. She, everything, she sees everything as far as I can tell from her writing she sees everything within the framework of, of parental alienation. And I've had to, to structure her a couple of times saying, I don't agree with those parental, because she keeps wanting to put me with those people and then blast those people and me by associate. No, there's no such thing as parental alienation. And I wish Jean Mercer would stop misleading people and lying to people, basically, that I'm, I'm part of that group. No, that's a bad thing. We need to all stop using the term parental alienation, including Gene Mercer. 
um, she needs to stop using it. We need to get over to real stuff like delusional thought disorders, personality disorders, and, and family systems. And so, you know, she's, but she's now an expert in her mind in attachment pathology and um, family court pathology. Uh, but I'm not seeing that based on her education, training, supervised experience, or professional experience. Um, she, her study, she's read some books, um, but that doesn't qualify her, I think, um, within the family courts. Um, let's take a look at um, mine. This is just one, one um, I have you know, publications and she, she bangs me a lot. She, she hammers me because they're all self-published in uh, my, uh, my, uh, my publications are self-published. I did it for a reason. I don't see the reason to pay a publisher money if they're not going to do anything for me. Um, so I self-published. And the other thing it does when I self-publish like that is it baits the pathogen because that was the argument they used against Gardner because he had no peer reviewed research for this new pathology he was making them. But I'm not proposing a new pathology. Oh my goodness, there's so much research around the attachment system, personality disorders, uh, delusional thought disorder. There's so much research over there. And so, um, but it, by, by self-publishing, the pathogen is patterns. So it doesn't actually process information. So it just applies the pattern of criticisms. So it's gonna be that there's no peer-reviewed research about Dr. Childers. That's spurious. There's plenty of peer-reviewed research about attachment and, and, and uh, family systems and delusional thought disorders. It'll say um, the peer, uh, that no peer-reviewed research. Dr. Childers has some sort of new theory. That's the other one. No, I have no new theory. I apply knowledge. I don't create it. And so if anybody says that Dr. Childers has a new theory, they're just uh, exposing their ignorance. And that Dr. Childress is a pedophile somehow. It's going to be a personal slander against me. That was Dr. Gardner was a pedophile. And, and it just, the, the pathogen attacks with personal slander as its third approach um, to pathology. And that's, in my view, what, what Dr. Mercer is doing with me. She just slanders me for um, vague reasons and, and without ever providing any substance um, to what her criticisms are. Um, so, but, uh, want to take a look. This is a journal article. Um, it came out of my work with uh, Jim Swanson, who's like a top high grand kahuna in ADHD. Um, and that's one of the reasons I went down to work with him. It's um, UCI Child Development Center is, holy cow, he's one of the best in ADHD. And, um, and this was just the article that was generated from my work there. Now you notice I'm fourth article, children's, or fourth, for fourth author, Childress C. Leanne Tam was the first author. Uh, she was my colleague. She organized, they hired one psychologist to organize the operation of the, the research or the program, the intervention program. And I was brought on as a clinical psychologist to do the field operations to actually make the, the thing happen. Um, and Leanne Tam was interested in becoming a researcher like Jim Swanson. I was not, I was, I'm a clinical person. I like working with people rather than researching. Then Jim Swanson is number two because he's the Grand High Kahuna. Uh, it was his project. Mark Lerner is the medical director at UCI. So he got the third position. I got fourth author position because I ran the project. So you see all those, those authors beneath that. Those are the people I was kind of supervising and working with and running the project. So everything you read in that article is what I did. Okay, That was my job was to make that project happen. Then Patterson and Lakes were two postdocs at uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County, who I supervised on this rotation. Um, uh, I supervised them in their autism rotation and in their and then this rotation with Jim Swanson and, and this project. And then all the other people that worked on the project. Notice it's intervention for preschoolers. So I'm early childhood. I'm doing preschool stuff, but it's ADHD with preschoolers. And notice this. This is relevant to the family court stuff. So service before diagnosis. And, and that, we can do that in the family courts. We can provide service before diagnosis, early intervention, it would be called. Um, we can do all of that. I'm trained in exactly this. I've got a big old research article in exactly service before diagnosis. And look, look, it's in clinical neuroscience research. That's a big journal, clinical neuroscience research. And I'm fourth author in that. 
And I, I just generate, I could be producing uh, lots of uh, research if that was my interest. It just wasn't my interest. And I was recruited out of this project. So I was totally fine being in this project. And I'd be generating articles and be, a, you know, moving up in the field of ADHD and preschoolers. But I was recruited out of it for that clinical director position out in San Bernardino County with working with kids in the foster care. So I left this to go work with children in the foster care. Um, so that is, is sort of the, the comparison between uh, our Vitas um, or between, and, and here I've got Gene Mercer out there publicly posting on the uh, internet slamming my professional reputation, saying I don't know anything about attachment, and she does. And I'm just not seeing it. So um, I, know, I know because she does a lot of criticism of me on the internet when the opposing counsel is looking for somebody to contradict me, they will locate her sometimes. And I can tell through the cross-examination that they've located her. Um, and uh, that is in misleading the court. And if any actual family uh, law attorney allows Jean Mercer to qualify as an expert based on her Vita and stuff, uh, you're not doing your job. Um, so this is her Vita. This is how she can be critiqued on it um, relative to her competence uh, based on her opinions. Uh, Dr. Mercer has not assessed, diagnosed, or treated any pathology ever in her life she has not been educated to no coursework on the assessment, diagnosis, or treatment of any pathology ever in her life. And um, she's had no training in the diagnosis uh, or treatment of any pathology ever in her life. And yet she's out here opining on the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of one of the most difficult pathologies, uh, narcissistic borderline dark personality um, and attachment pathology in the family courts. Um, so that's, uh, one of the first, uh, people we'll take a look at in the family courts is, um, Dr. Mercer. Uh, I put her in that category of sort of random people. It's unclear as to why they have an interest in the family court or what relevance their, their opinion has to the issues in the family courts. And as we develop standards of practice or reestablish standards of practice in the family courts, one of the first things we're going to have to do is limit this to licensed people, uh, people who are actually have um, training in clinical psychology, uh, the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of pathology. Then we're going to look at different levels of that. So we have master's level people, we have doctor's level people, we have psychiatrists, um, MD level people. And we'll be taking a look at the various VITAs for all of those different uh, kind of categories and professionals that are over here, um, seeing where, where they got their background uh, competence in, in what they're doing. So with that, um, you can follow me over to the, the next uh, in line with the VITA series.